Uh, Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 131, so if you have your Bible, you can open there, and if you need a Bible, it's the the white book on the seat tray in front of you. Uh, Jim is going to read for us this morning uh, Psalm 131. Psalm 131, a childlike spirit. Lord, my heart's not proud, my eyes are not haughty. I do not get involved with things too great or too difficult for me. Instead, I've calmed and quieted myself, like a little weaned child with its mother. I'm like a little child. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forever. It's the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Amen. Uh, If you have your Bible, open to uh, the book of Galatians, chapter 4. Today we'll be looking at verses 21 through 31. Galatians chapter 4, 21 through 31. All right. Now, I just uh, just want to remind everyone that uh, this section of the letter... Uh, Galatians is a letter, right? It's a letter to the churches in Galatia. Uh, This section of the letter has been dealing at length with the doctrine of justification by faith. Uh, That discussion, as as many of us will recall, started in the middle of chapter 2, and it concludes here in in this ending section of chapter 4. The reason for this long discussion was because, obviously, of the men who had come to Galatia who were teaching the Christians there to keep the laws of Moses. Uh, In order to correct that false teaching, the apostle has uh, systematically given us a a number of lessons about the laws of Moses up to this point. Uh, Now, I'm I'm not going to recount every one of those, uh, but up to this point we have learned a a number of very valuable lessons about the laws of Moses and the purpose that they served uh, in in the period of time between Moses and Christ. Um, But perhaps the most important lesson that we have learned is that the period for which those laws were given came to an end with Christ. Uh, Today we have reached the last scriptural proof of this point, and it is an illustration that is drawn from Abraham's life uh, with his two wives, uh, Hagar and Sarah, and his two sons, uh, Ishmael and Isaac. And so as we uh, look at that today, I just want us to to keep those things in mind uh, because we are reading uh, that last section here with this final uh, scriptural proof in verses 21 through 31. So again, uh, beginning at verse 21, uh, the Apostle Paul is writing. He's talking to these Galatian Christians, and he says to them uh, in verse 21, "'Tell me, those of you who want to be under the law, don't you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and the other by a free woman. But the one by the slave was born according to the impulse of the flesh, while the one by the free woman was born as a result of the promise. These things are illustrations, for the women represent the two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai and bears children into slavery. This is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, childless woman who does not give birth. Burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate are many, more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of the promise. But just as then the child born according to the flesh persecuted the one born according to the Spirit, so it is also now. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her son, for the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. There should be more amens than that. Amen. 
everything we have cover to cover in this book we call the Bible is the Word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 You know, uh, that last uh, section there strikes me, particularly uh, the quote uh, that, that's given, uh, drive out the slave and her son, for the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Many of you should remember that from when we went through uh, Genesis, that section of Genesis, uh, just a, a couple of months ago. That is a quote of Sarah's words recorded in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 10. And very simply, the scripture tells us that Sarah was not only speaking about her present situation, but she was also speaking prophetically about the church. She was speaking prophetically about us, about our situation. Ishmael was the child of human impulse, or you might say human works. Isaac was the child born supernaturally by the, the Spirit of God, by the miracle of God. And it is only the child born of God who will inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, there is one thing and, and one alone which makes us sons and daughters of God, and it is this. It is new birth through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the language of the New Testament is exceptionally clear. Uh, the, the words that are used are, are regeneration, born again, born of God, appointed to eternal life. Uh, we really need to think about this because uh, the meaning of these terms is new life. Uh, it is a, a new life which God gives. It is not something that we can create on our own. We can't generate it ourselves. Uh, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, and we can do nothing about it. Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, you may recall, when Nicodemus came to visit him uh, one evening, Jesus told Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot perceive the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Nicodemus asked a question. He said, how, when a man is old, can he go back into his mother's womb? That's a valid question, don't you think? How, once you have actually been born, can you go back into your mother's womb. Well, new birth does not happen in the same way as your original birth did. New birth is a, a supernatural act of, of God's Spirit when He shows you the truth about Christ. Uh, the Holy Spirit shows you that Christ is the eternal Son of God. He, he shows you that Christ became a man and He gave His life on the cross for your sins. He, he shows you that uh, Christ was raised from the dead. Uh, the Spirit shows you that you are a sinner, that you are in need of, of what Christ has done for you, that you're in need of God's forgiveness. He brings you to repentance and faith. Uh, as 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1 says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, in other words, whoever believes that Jesus is the Savior, is born of God. You know, the, the very nature of new birth is that it places me in an entirely different position with God. Uh, I was under God's wrath, but now I am an object of His love. I was dead in my sins, but now I am alive in Christ. I was headed for punishment in hell, but now I am seated in heaven. Right? This is an entirely different position in our uh, relationship to God. As a, as a result of faith in Christ, everything about me has changed in God's eyes. Unfortunately, however, and, and many of us know this to be true for ourselves, though God sees me differently, I don't always see myself differently. Uh, not everything about me has changed in my own eyes. Uh, I know that I still sin. I know that I still struggle each day with worldly desires. Uh, I know that I am not perfect. Oftentimes I wonder, when will I be? I have been set apart as holy. I have been called holy. But each day that I live this life, I find that holiness is what I lack. When will this change? Well, for these reasons, I am often tempted to begin working for my salvation. Uh, trying to do things to get closer to God, uh, trying to compensate for my sins with good works, trying to find things that I can do in order to feel better about myself or, or to feel more spiritual. 
However, I must drive out all of these things from my life and my thinking, and I must remind myself of what God has done. God knows the, the changes that He is going to make in my life over time. God knows the final change that He will make when I stand before Him, and God knows the change that He has already made within me. Uh, just as a uh, new birth then puts us in an entirely different position with God, it also puts us in an entirely uh, different or entirely new position with respect to the laws of Moses. That is the point that is being illustrated here in this, this final demonstration from the Scripture. So I want to, to go back through what we have read with, with those things in mind, and let's look again at uh, verse 21. You know, when Paul says, uh, tell me those of you who want to be under the law, we should understand that Paul is not talking about the laws of our governments. Right? He's not talking about the laws of this country. He's not talking about the laws of the state of North Carolina. He's not talking about the laws of Nags Head. Right? Uh, he is talking about the laws of Moses. Uh, we don't want to misunderstand this because Christians are supposed to be law-abiding citizens. We are supposed to pay our taxes. We are supposed to drive the speed limit. We are supposed to be model citizens of, of the, the countries and the, the towns and the societies that we live in. Well, why is that? Well, because when we received Christ, our citizenship changed. We became citizens of heaven. And as citizens of heaven, we are supposed to respect the authority that is in place here on the earth in all instances where uh, the laws of man do not conflict with the laws of God. And uh, it is our witness to, to, to Christ uh, as part of our witness to the truth uh, about Him that we respect the authority that is in place here on earth. Uh, when we read this verse, however, we are correct if we understand that there is a question being asked which is meant to suggest that we should not be under the law. Uh, so we want to be very clear that this is not talking about the laws of our governments, it's talking about the laws of Moses. We, um, <clears throat> we might ask, or someone might ask based on this, well, well what is, if it's talking about the laws of Moses, then what is, what is wrong with the laws of Moses? Why should we not want to be under them? Aren't they God's Word? Aren't, aren't they good because they are from God? Aren't they His laws and decrees? Uh, doesn't God's Word endure forever? So what is wrong with being under the laws of Moses? Well, yes, the, the laws of Moses are God's Word and they are good. Uh, however, uh, we have already been told that they could never give life. They could only reveal our sin and put us to death. We have uh, been told that no one is justified by the works of the law. We are only justified through faith in Christ. We are told that no one has ever received the Holy Spirit by the law but only through faith in Christ. And we have been told that the laws of Moses served a temporary purpose. They were given as a guardian for the nation of Israel until the time of Christ. The fact of the matter is the, the word of the Lord does endure forever. But when God has said that the law was added because of transgressions until Christ would come, Galatians 3.19, that is also the word of the Lord and it does endure forever. Uh, I do not know if you are someone who has ever wanted to be under the law, but if you are, you should listen to what is being said here. Being under the laws of Moses is not the natural position for a Christian. That is the whole reason for this question. It's the whole reason for the entire letter that we've been reading. It was, it was the natural position for a Jew it was the natural position for ancient Israel. But Christ has come, so it is now not the natural position for anyone who's received Him. Uh, to illustrate this, <clears throat> Paul goes on to point out uh, that Abraham had two sons. Right In verses 22 and 23, we see that uh, one of them was by a slave woman, and, and that would be Ishmael. Uh, the other one was, was born of a free woman, and that would be Isaac. Uh, the one born 
by the slave was born according to the impulse of the flesh and, and, and the, the other was born as a, as a result of the promise. I don't know if you have ever done anything on an impulse before. Has anybody done anything on an impulse before? I think every hand has got to go up in, in that situation. Uh, but we know that's generally not good, correct? Doing things on an impulse is generally not good. Uh, in the Bible, the flesh is, is normally bad. I mean, it can mean your actual body, you know, your muscles and tissue and things like that, but very often it refers to the sinful nature. Some of us have given in to sim sinful impulses. We know that they have come from our sinful nature. Uh, for example, I have had a hard day, right? I know that I should not take comfort in alcohol. Uh, on an impulse, I decide to have a drink. That is something that comes from my sinful nature. Or, or someone says uh, something that rubs me the wrong way, right? I know that I should keep my mouth shut. I know that I should not retaliate. However, I've got that feeling inside at the moment, and it just comes right out of my mouth, and that is the result of a sinful impulse, right? We understand how these things happen. I don't think any one of us is, is immune to them, and we can probably think of many other examples beyond the, the couple that I've just given. Right? Uh, you, you should think about things that, that you yourself have done on the spur of the moment. <clears throat> think about things that you have done without thinking them through. Uh, have, have, have very many of those things ever turned out well? Things that you have done on the spur of the moment that you have not thought through, have they ever turned out very well? Right? That's the idea that we should have in mind here. Uh, because Abraham and Sarah would not wait on God's promise, if you will recall, they had been childless their whole lives and God had been promising for many, many, many years to, to give them a child. Because they would not wait on God's promise, they decided to speed things up for themselves. Uh, Sarah suggested, uh, I have this uh, servant girl. She's able to have a baby, most likely. Uh, this way, we can, we, I'll give, it, give her to you as a wife, and this way we can have a son. And, and that's how we'll make what God has promised happen for us. Right? Uh, Abraham did not think it through. He acted impulsively as well. Sure, let's do that. What could go wrong? Right? <clears throat> the Galatians have acted impulsively, and it is probably because they also wanted to speed something up. Uh, the Judaizers have come to them and said, keep the laws of Moses, right? Keep the laws of Moses, and you will become more holy, and you will get closer to God, and you will be more pleasing in His eyes. Don't you know that this is what He wants you to do? And the Galatians wanted to advance in their sanctification faster, I'm sure, and you might think for yourself about things that you have done to try and be sanctified faster, to get uh, a feeling of being more holy or a feeling of being closer to God, I'll do this or I'll do that. And, and Paul says, now, no, wait a minute here, look what happened with Abraham and Sarah. That was a sinful impulse and, and it, is, it, it was, did not bring about what God had promised. You know, there are, are people who, who talk about the Ten Commandments or they talk about the laws of Moses, but they, they, they do not talk about the penalty that the laws of Moses or the Ten Commandments impose for those who break them. Uh, the Judaizers were like this. They presented the laws of Moses as a wonderful thing. They presented the laws of Moses as a, a way to grow closer to God. They did not present the, the law in the fullness of its ministry, but that is what Paul is talking about here, and it's what he has been talking about here. You need to understand the fullness of the ministry that the laws of Moses uh, uh, had, that it's a, it's, a, it's a ministry of death. It's a ministry that, that, that puts everyone in the dust. It's a ministry that says you cannot possibly please God because you are not capable. You know, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they had been slaves for 400 years. They had no legal system of their own, and the best example that they had were the, the laws of Egypt and the laws of the nations around them. Uh, God's laws were wonderful compared to the laws of their neighbors, uh, but they were also terrifying at the same time. 
God's laws were, were just and they were gracious, but they also exposed sin in ways that human laws never could. Keeping the law in its entirety came with a blessing. But failing at any single point put the Israelites under God's curse, under His judgment. The Galatians mistakenly want to be under the law, but they don't even know what the law says. And so, if you would look back at, at, at the first verse that we read, Paul says to them, hear the law, listen to what the law is saying. We should also hear the law, so let's look at what happened when God gave it. I'm going to read to you from Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 21, because we also should hear the law. On the third day when morning came, there was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain and a loud trumpet sound, so that all the people in the camp shuddered. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. Then the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. The Lord directed Moses, Go down and warn the people not to break through to see the Lord. Otherwise, many of them will die. That was the experience of the Israelites as the law was given to them. God told the people to stand back, actually to stand afar off when He gave the law to Moses. And if we would go on to chapter 20, verses 18 through 19, we would read this. All the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountains surrounded by smoke. When the people saw it, they trembled and they stood at a distance. You speak to us, they told Moses, and we will listen, but don't let God speak to us or we will die. You know, we simply cannot conceive of how holy God is. Human beings are renegades in God's universe. We are in the position of being lost sinners until Christ comes to us and saves us. We have no capacity within ourselves to obey or to follow God. And Romans 8, 6 tells us that to be carnally minded is death. That is how uh, each and every one of us starts out from birth. We are carnally minded and we are bound to death. However, that verse also goes on to say, uh, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Well, how do you become spiritually minded? How do you gain this life and peace? When we receive Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. You and I are no longer the natural man or the natural woman. We become the, the spiritual person. Each day the Spirit grows us to be more and more spiritually minded. That is how it happens. The laws of Moses, however, were given to carnally minded people. They were given to the natural human being. The world has been carnally minded ever since Adam and Eve sinned and it is not getting any better. You can look around today and see that it is getting worse and worse. Every day since Adam and Eve were, were uh, cast out of the garden, it has been getting worse. Romans 8, 7 tells us the, the carnal mind is against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, and neither can it be. In other words, the carnal mind is, is, it, carnal mind is not able to be subject to the law of God. It's no wonder that the children of Israel trembled with fear. It's no wonder that they, they shuddered and they didn't want the Lord to speak to them directly. It's no wonder that they moved away from the mountain. The law was death to them and they knew it. Uh, by Paul's time, however, the rabbis no longer presented the law this way. They no longer presented the laws of Moses as a death sentence. They no longer taught that it condemned all as sinners. They no longer taught that it required 100% obedience all the time to everything written in it. Instead, they said, uh, you can earn God's favor if you, if you do these things, even if you don't do them perfectly, but if you just do these things, then, then, then you'll gain merit with God. They forgot about their sins. They forgot about the, the, the requirement of the Lord that, that, that you have to be 100% perfect. 
and they, they taught that the law was actually a way to grow closer to God and to earn His favor. But Paul wants the Galatians to understand the truth of the matter. That is not the way the law works at all. Now, some of us know the events of Abraham's life occurred long before the law was ever given, and so someone might ask the question here, well, I understand all of that, and that, that's all well and good, but what exactly does, does the story about Abraham have to do with hearing the law? I mean, you went to Exodus to talk about that. What, what, what does Abraham have to do with hearing the law? Well, the term the law does not only refer to the laws of Moses, which we know are recorded in Exodus, uh, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, but the, the, law, uh, the law is also a term for the first five books of the Bible, the books that Moses wrote, uh, uh, which, which Genesis is the first one of those. Uh, what we are being told here is that within the law, within the books of the law, uh, we are given an illustration from Abraham's life. That's what verse 24 is telling us. Now, some of your Bibles uh, use the word allegory instead of illustration. Uh, that does not mean that we can allegorize the Bible. Does anybody know what it means to have an allegory? You know, these things are this or that. Uh, but let's not look at them as what they actually are. Let's uh, spiritualize or invent some meaning that's behind that, right, so that everything represents something else. We're not being given license to do that with the Bible. Uh, the word illustration is actually a very good translation of what Paul means by the Greek word allegoria. And what we're being told here is that these things were given previously uh, in order to present a message to us today, right? Paul uses this word, and, and what he's saying is these events contain a message for us, an illustration of, of a point that we need to understand now. Well, well, what is that message? What is that point that we need to understand now? Well, it's, it's, it's very simply uh, here in, in, in verses 25 and 26, Hagar represents the Old Covenant. She represents Mount Sinai, where the laws of Moses were given. She was a slave, and the children she produces are slaves. You know, we don't have a lot of experience with slavery today. Many times we think of people who have been stolen from their homeland. Uh, we think about people who have maybe have been uh, abducted and they have been sold into to some, some, some type of uh, a trafficking arrangement. Um, you know, in ancient Israel and, and also at the, the time uh, this letter was written, most, most slaves, however, were either born into slavery or they went into slavery because of debt, right? In other words, if, if your mother was a slave, then you were a slave when you were born because your mother was a slave. Uh, or if you could not pay your debts, you became a slave because you could not pay your debts, uh, that may be a timely word for, for some of us. Uh, you know, the average American, according to uh, something that I saw recently, the average uh, American has about $53,000 of debt. Uh, we might need to think about that because uh, we want to consider here how, how debt puts us into slavery, how debt becomes our master. You know, what decisions do, do you have to make about your work and what decisions do you have to make about your income simply based on the amount of debt that you have and the payments that you've got to make each month. Uh, what are the things that you can do or what are the things that you cannot do because you are trying to make those payments because you took that debt? You know, what do you have to do? What are you not free to do because of that? You know, the idea of slavery is simply that. You are not free. You have a master. The, the, what the master says you must do. Uh, this was the relationship of, of Israel to the law under the Old Covenant. The law was their master because the law revealed the debt that they owed to God, the debt that they owed because of their sins. So the law, actually not God, was their master. In order to be freed, their debt had to be paid. Christians are free. Why are we free? Because our debt has been paid. We have been set free from the debt of sin that we owe God. The law is no longer our master. Christ has purchased our freedom, and He is our master. 
verse 26 tells us just that, that the Jerusalem above corresponds to Sarah. She is the free woman. She represents the new covenant. <clears throat> and the children she gives birth to are not slaves. They are free. Uh, the two Jerusalems that are being talked about here in verses 25 and, and 26 are different. One is uh, the actual Jerusalem, right? The Jerusalem, which uh, is, 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 is the city of Jerusalem in Israel. She is the earthly Jerusalem. She is the Jerusalem who rejected Christ. She is the city who put Christ to death. She is the city who is still in slavery with all of her children, and she represents the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, who are still in bondage under the laws of Moses. The Jerusalem above in verse 26 is the heavenly Jerusalem. It is the new Jerusalem presented to us in the 20th chapter of Revelation as it comes down from God out of heaven. You know, the old Jerusalem is the, the mother city of those under the law. The, the new Jerusalem is the mother city of those under grace. Since the person who believes in Christ has been born from above or born from God, we do not have a citizenship which is tied to national Israel. We have a citizenship in the new creation, the Jerusalem which comes from above. In verse 27, Paul goes on then and he quotes Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 1. <clears throat> Rejoice, childless woman who does not give birth. If you will recall, Sarah was the childless woman. She was the one who could not conceive. She was completely barren until the miracle birth of Isaac. Burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate are many, more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. Hagar was the woman who could give birth. She was given uh, Abraham as a, as a husband, but Sarah actually had more children than Hagar. How did that happen? Well, because everyone who is in Christ is her child. The, the very simple point being made here is that God has saved more people under the new covenant than He ever did under the old. And if you think about that, the nation of Israel existed for 1,500 years. Uh, that was from the giving of the law 430 years after the time of Abraham uh, until the destruction of the temple by the Romans in, in the year 70 A.D. Israel was one small country in the Middle East, but for almost 2,000 years the church has been spreading the gospel to every nation. There are millions upon millions of people who have been brought into the church each day there are more and more to come, and, and who knows how many more years before the return of Christ. Then we are given the reminder that this was God's plan all along. Look at verse 28. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of the promise. You know, Paul's use of the word brothers is very important here. He is not talking about brothers by natural birth. He is not talking about people who are related by DNA. Paul is talking about the family of God. He's talking about those who are brothers and sisters through faith in Christ. Believers today are also children of the same promise that was spoken to Abraham all those years ago when God promised him a son. You know, God spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, and he said, I will give you a son. And he also told him, through you all nations will be blessed. God made a similar promise after Adam and Eve sinned. He said the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, Genesis 3.15. God told King David, I will raise up a son after you and establish his kingdom forever. That's 2 Samuel chapter 7. And the Lord said through Isaiah, this will be a sign for you. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. His name will be called Emmanuel, that is, God with us. You know, this is a, a you might say, well, this is, this is all very wonderful, Pastor, and, 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 and I'm very happy to hear all of these, these various scriptures, but, but what does this mean for me? You know, does this have an application to my life today? Well, the answer is yes. Yes, it does. 
It has an application to your life today because if you have believed in Christ, you have believed this same promise that was given to all of these people. God did not only make a promise to Adam. He did not only make a promise to King David. He did not only make a promise to Abraham. He did not only make a promise through Isaiah. God has made a promise to you, and He has made a promise to me. He has made a promise to all who will believe. God said, I sent my Son to die for you. If you believe in Him, you will not perish. You will have eternal life. The question is, do you believe that promise? If you have, then you are a brother or you are a sister with Isaac. You are a child of the promise also. This is the point that Paul wants to get through to the Galatians. I, I hope it's a point that is, is getting through to us today as well. Uh, going on then, uh, we have an explanation for what is happening to the Galatians, and I want to remind you that in particular they are, they are being troubled by these Judaizers who are, are coming and trying to, 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 to take away their, their freedom in Christ and, and trying to put them into bondage uh, under the laws of Moses. And we have an explanation of what's happening to them. We are told in, in, in verse 29 that they are being persecuted. If you will recall from, from Genesis, uh, Ishmael began to act out when Isaac was born. Do you remember that? Uh, Ishmael began to persecute him. Uh, we are being told that this is the exact same thing which the Judaizers are doing to the Galatian Christians, but just as then the child born according to the flesh persecuted the one born according to the Spirit, so that is what is happening now. That is your situation. Ishmael thought, I was here first and the inheritance should be mine. He didn't really like having a, 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 an, another brother. Uh, Ishmael was the child born of works. He was born of the flesh. Isaac was the child born of God's work, born of the Spirit. Ishmael resented Isaac and he began to cause trouble for him. Now, I do not think it, that it's headline news to anyone here that we might suffer persecution for our faith in Christ. Some of us in this room have, have likely suffered persecution for our faith in Christ. We know brothers and sisters uh, uh, in, 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 in news not, not terribly long ago uh, who were beheaded uh, for their faith in Christ. We know Christians have been jailed and killed uh, through the centuries for their faith in Christ. You may also have suffered uh, some degree of persecution, whether large or small. Family or friends may have turned against you because of your faith. Perhaps you've lost a job because of sharing the gospel or because you would not do certain things that violated your, your Christian convictions. But it may surprise some of us to know that persecution might come to us from those who are within the church people who appear to be our brothers and sisters. Paul's point to the Galatians is they are being persecuted by people who they think are their brothers and sisters, but the Judaizers are not their true brothers. Outwardly, Ishmael and Isaac both appeared to be Abraham's children. Inwardly, however, only one was born of the Spirit. Only one of them was a child of grace. The point here is the same for us today. We may find legalists masquerading around in the church as children of grace. They will look like us. They will claim to be like us, but they will try to subject us to their rules and to their way of life. You know, I heard about uh, another pastor who, who had a, a woman in his church that everyone was afraid of, and some of you have heard me tell this story before. Uh, she, had a, she had very specific ideas about what it meant to be holy and what it meant to uh, live life properly for the Lord. She would look at what other people were doing, and if you did not measure up to her standards, if she did not approve of what you were doing, then she would go around telling all, uh, other people all kinds of things about you. Uh, no one wanted to end up as the person who she talked about, and so everyone was very careful around her. Uh, a new man, however, came to the church, and, and he did not know much about this woman, uh, but he soon found out for himself. Uh, she saw his truck parked in front of a bar one evening, so she went around and told everybody in the church that he was a drunk. 
She did not know that his truck had, had broken down uh, on the street in front of the bar and he had pushed it into the parking lot until he could come back and get it later. Uh, it, is, it is very unfortunate. Some of you know the rest of that story too. It is, it is very unfortunate, uh, but the reality is this. There are people in the church who are not children of grace, or at least they do not act with any measure of grace. Uh, they will try to make you live according to their opinions and their standards. They will try to make you feel guilty for, for not living up to their ideals. They will try to become your master. <clears throat> you cannot allow that to happen. So if you find yourself in this situation, what then should you do? What should you do? Well, look at verse 30. <clears throat> and quite simply, kick legalism out of your life. Drive out the slave and her son, for the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Now, this is again a quote of Genesis 21 and verse 10. It is where God commanded the expulsion of, of Hagar and Ishmael. And the word to us today is exactly the same. Get rid of your legalism and put all of the emphasis on Christ. Why? Well, quite simply, verse 31, because we are not children of the slave, but we are children of the free woman. You know, the, the glorious news of our faith is that Christ has brought us into a relationship of love and grace with God. This did not happen because of something that you or I did. It did not happen because we followed some rule or formula. No, it, it happened because Christ came to you and He came to me. It happened because God promised uh, God, God, God promised that He would do it. Uh, before the creation of the world, Christ said, I will come. I will give my life on the cross for their sins. I will pay their debts, and I will set them free. It has happened because Christ has done exactly what He has said that He would do. And when you believed that, Christ saved you. He reconciled you to God. He made you a son or daughter of, uh, of the Father. He became your, your Lord and your Savior. So as we conclude today, uh, uh, I, I, do not have, uh, I don't have points to make, but rather I have uh, questions that we should each consider. <clears throat> the first one is, are you trying to be saved by something other than Christ? That's one that we need to think about for ourselves. Are you trying to be saved by something other than Christ? Do you, do you need something more than what Jesus did on the cross for you? And finally, have you accepted God's grace in your life? You know, Abraham could not have Hagar and Sarah. He could not have Ishmael and Isaac. And you cannot have Christ and your legalism. Abraham had to make a choice, and, and you have to make that choice, and I have to make that choice. It's very easy as human beings to default into legalism, to default into rules and regulations and boxes to check and, and things that, that we, we look at uh, to, to kind of measure how am I doing with God. Abraham had to make a choice, and we have to make that choice also. You are either saved by grace or you are not saved at all. So let me ask are you carrying around a spare tire? Are you hanging on to something else that is going to save you? Do you have an insurance plan or a backup plan? Right? Are you relying on, on something other than Jesus? Do you, do you feel that, that, that you're doing something or that you are being something or, or, or that, uh, that um, you're trying to attain something which adds to what Jesus did for you? Whether it is the laws of Moses or it is some other system of earning righteousness that substitutes for grace, the problem is exactly the same. We are saved by grace. But God's grace can be difficult to accept because our fallen nature rebels against it. We want to do something. We want to have some ground to stand on. We want to have something that we can claim as ours. Even true believers can 
fall backward into the trap of working for God's grace. Even after being saved, we can find it difficult to rest in the full knowledge of what Christ has done for us, and that is something that we need to, to, to be aware of and to avoid. So if you are in any of these traps today, I would encourage you to leave them behind. Run back to Christ and, and look no further than Him. Receive everything from the Lord. Now, if you are here today and you have never before accepted Christ, I would encourage you to do that now. There, there are only two groups of, of people in the world. There are those who are being saved, and there are those who are going to hell, and, and Ishmael and Isaac give us another example of that. They show us both. You know, we have no way to save ourselves. We must trust in Christ completely. And so if you are here today and you have never done that, if you have never understood that, that, that Christ Himself is the Lord, that He came and gave His life on the cross for your sins and that He was raised from the dead so that, that you can be made right with God, so that you can be forgiven and, and receive eternal life and, and, and be justified before the Lord, if you have never understood that but today you do, then I would encourage you to turn to Him.